The man opens the door and sees his wife and daughter in the hallway. This scene was exactly what Rick had been anticipating. Over a year had passed since the war against the saviors. People have rebuilt houses and planted fruits and vegetables. The Alexandria safe zone has been rebuilt. They've even gone solar with Eugene's help. Everything was progressing in a positive direction. However, Rick was no longer the sole leader of a single community. He now had to maintain the new order that had been established. It's not as easy as Rick thought it would be. A year ago, he hadn't eradicated the remaining members of Salvation Hall. Instead, he had provided them with food and window glass, hoping they could become self-sufficient like the other communities. But a year had passed, and it seemed that the saviors hadn't improved. The windows were still broken, and despite some workers actively planting vegetables, their crops continued to wither. So, for over a year, the saviors had relied on supplies from the hilltop. Daryl has become the leader of the saviors and he doesn't know what to do about the situation. He even began reading books. Laura came to report to Daryl that their food had run out again. With no other option, Daryl contacted Tara to ask her to inform Rick that they needed to search for supplies in the city. The communities were too far apart for radio signals to reach. So Rick had established relay stations with a representative from each community to pass on messages. Soon, individuals from Alexandria Safe Zone, the Kingdom, the Hilltop, and Oceanside all gathered in the city. A year had passed, and one of Gabriel's eyes was now completely blind. Giving him a new kind of charm, Maggie had developed the hilltop well and arrived in a horse-drawn carriage. They eventually reached their destination for the day. A large museum. There was something they wanted. The group cautiously entered the museum, which was covered in dust. Occasional stray zombies posed little threat to them. Rick instructed everyone to split up and search for what they needed. Then reconvene at the meeting point. Maggie and her group arrived in the main hall of the building, which left them in awe. It was hard to imagine how it had been constructed. Quickly, they noticed that the glass floor was hiding zombies beneath it. But fortunately, this type of material was unlikely to shatter, so they didn't pay it much mind. They began to split up and take action. The Alexandria Safe Zone guys went to a storage room. Rick opened drawer after drawer, eventually uncovering bags of packaged items. The labels indicated a comprehensive variety of seed types. Jotties recommended this place and Gabriel wonders how she knew it had seeds. Jotties explained that she had been a teacher and had brought her students here on a field trip. They had discovered that this place had preserved nearly every type of seed. It was quite the unexpected treasure in the post-apocalyptic world. Perhaps this find could improve the savior's current situation. Meanwhile, Maggie had stumbled upon a plow, which could be a great asset for agriculture. She decides to take it back, have the blacksmith duplicate it, and give the saviors a. In the end, Everyone found what they were looking for. Even coming across a large medieval-style carriage, they carefully secured it with ropes and slowly lowered it down. They were cautious, fearing that the glass beneath couldn't withstand the weight. Following Rick's guidance, they moved the carriage down step by step. However, they failed to notice that as the wheels turned, cracks had begun to form in the glass, and these cracks were expanding as they moved. Fortunately, their careful approach allowed them to successfully move the carriage across. Now, only a small boat and the plow remained. Seeing the cracks in the glass, Rick kept his cool and instructed them to maintain a steady pace. Ezekiel and Carol quickly left with the plow, but an unexpected incident occurred as Ezekiel slipped and fell. Fortunately, they were all tied with ropes, preventing the zombies from immediately attacking Ezekiel. However, the zombies were still able to grasp his clothes. If the rope were to break, Ezekiel's fate would be grim. Rick quickly organized the team to pull the rope upward, while Daryl used his crossbow to kill zombies and cover Ezekiel. Eventually, with a tense effort, Ezekiel managed to climb back up, narrowly avoiding disaster. Carol rushed forward to comfort Ezekiel, her own nerves still rattled from the scare. Then they loaded up their supplies and started back. This time the community found what they were looking for when they went out looking for supplies. On the way back, Daryl continued to lead the group on his motorcycle. With gasoline being a precious commodity, horseback riding had become the preferred mode of transportation among the communities. The young people behind were engaged in conversation. Among them was a man named Ken, the blacksmith's son from the hilltop. It was his first time on an outing, and he had made new friends. Ezekiel deliberately lingered at the back. The close call he had experienced earlier had left him shaken, fearing he might not have the chance to do certain things before it was too late. Consequently, Ezekiel took out a ring and proposed to Carol. After a few seconds of silence, 
Carol declined, stating she wasn't ready and using the excuse that she didn't want to be proposed to on horseback. Instead of being disappointed Ezekiel smiled and said to Carol, I love you and I will always love you, he promised to keep the ring and wait until she was ready. Daryl and Rosita come back and tell Rick they've both found something. They reported a large horde of zombies in the neighborhood, causing a bridge to collapse and cutting off the shortest route to the communities. The alternative route was twice the distance and infested with zombies. Rick immediately ordered everyone to seek refuge at the nearest locations, the hilltop and Salvation Hall. Until the horde dispersed in a couple of days, the group quickly set off to evade the approaching zombies. An hour later, they encountered a problem, the carriage had become stuck in the mud, and the horses were exhausted. Maggie suggested leaving these items here and sending someone to retrieve them in a couple of days, but Michonne believed they should try to salvage them now. She argued that the approaching horde of zombies would likely destroy the items in their path. Rick decided to rest the horses in an open area while they attempted to free the stuck carriage. Despite the combined efforts of several strong warriors, the carriage remained stubbornly immobile. In the distance, Michonne cried out as she spotted scattered zombies approaching, with the zombies still some distance away. They redoubled their efforts to pull the carriage. Luckily, this time the carriage was dragged up. By now the zombies have moved in. Rick asked the others to bring in the horses and pull the wagon while he took Daryl and Michonne to stop the zombies. Just then, a zombie appeared up ahead, causing the horse to become startled and restless. There was no other choice. The zombies were getting closer. Rick reluctantly had them abandon the carriage and retreat. Ken also untied the ropes from the horse's body. However, as they ran a few meters away, Ken noticed another rope still tethered to the horse. Ignoring the advice of Rick and the others, Ken went back and proceeded to cut the rope from the carriage. But the zombies had already pounced on Ken. His cries of agony agitated the nearby horse, which kicked Ken in the chest. Rick had no choice but to lead the men to kill the zombies. The others checked Ken's injuries. Originally, amputation could have prevented infection, but the fatal wound was the one caused by the horse's kick to Ken's chest. Despite Siddick's encouragement for Ken to stay conscious and hold on, it was ultimately in vain. Maggie felt deep sorrow. As a leader, she had taken Ken out, but couldn't bring him back alive. Rick's side had cleared the zombies and watched them in silence. This situation is not easy for anyone's heart. Maggie could only endure the pain and send Ken on his final journey. That night, Maggie and her people returned to the hilltop. Maggie's first task upon returning was to inform Ken's parents of the tragic news. Ken's mother struggled to accept it. Her son had lost his life for a plow. Tammy lashed out at Maggie. Is this how you lead? Her son didn't need to go out there. He didn't even die for the hilltop. Look at what you've accomplished in the past year. Feeding the saviors with their food wasn't enough. You got Ken killed. Maggie remained silent. Understanding the pain of being a parent, after a while, the people of the hilltop gathered to hold a funeral for Ken. Everyone was heavy-hearted. Ken is very popular here. But now, that cheerful young man was gone. Maggie could only hold her son and pray upstairs. The couple didn't want to see her right now. Rick and his group then arrived at Salvation Hall. It was the first time for the workers to see Rick and they all looked at him with curiosity and gratitude. Rick had liberated them, granting them the gift of freedom and equality. At that moment, Michonne noticed something on the wall and asked Daryl if this kind of thing happened often. Written on the wall was, The Savior saved us. We're still Negan. Daryl explained, somewhat resignedly, that there would always be a few troublemakers in the shadows. Especially more after crops wither, the workers gathered around, shaking Rick's hand in gratitude. The man in the lead is the representative of the workers. He pleads with Rick to help them through this difficult time, because now the crops are dying and people are depressed. Rick addressed them, urging them to stay strong. He assured them that they had brought back new seeds and tools this time, which would surely resolve their current issues. Together, they could overcome any challenge. The workers applauded when they saw hope. However, Daryl pulled Rick aside to a more secluded spot and shared his thoughts. He suggested that Rick should assign someone else to manage this place again. Daryl expressed his preference for being outside the high walls and admitted he wasn't cut out for leadership. He criticized the saviors, claiming they were too pampered and unlikely to change their old ways. Daryl also advised Rick against dispersing their own people, suggesting that they should stick to the original small team. In the apocalypse, they were incredibly strong as a cohesive unit, but Rick disagreed with Daryl's idea. For one, they couldn't afford to give up halfway whenever they encounter challenges. Secondly, there's no one left to replace Daryl. Daryl could only smoke alone in frustration at the thought of having to stay here. Carol, sensing Daryl's frustration, approached him for a chat. They also discussed Ezekiel. Daryl could only offer his blessings. 
Though a hint of jealousy might have lingered beneath the surface, sometimes, missed opportunities were just that, missed. Carol proposed helping Daryl take over for a while. She encouraged him to pursue whatever he wanted to do. Carol could use the time to figure out if she should accept Ezekiel's proposal or not. They leaned against each other under the moonlight, having already become family in each other's eyes. Meanwhile, at the hilltop, Ken's funeral had concluded, and his mother had fallen into a sorrowful sleep after having a bit of wine. At this moment, Gregory entered their room, intending to have a conversation with Ken's father. Of course Gregory is here to badmouth Maggie. Naturally, Gregory told Earl that Maggie was nothing more than Rick's lapdog, obediently doing whatever Rick said. If he was still the leader, Ken wouldn't be dead. So, it's Maggie, this woman, who's responsible for your son's death. Gregory claims that he's talked to a lot of people who aren't happy with the way things are. They're just afraid to say so. After a while, Maggie couldn't sleep and decided to take a walk with her son. Unexpectedly, she encountered Gregory there as well. When Gregory saw Maggie, he looked so pleased with her, he didn't have the arrogance he had when he was talking behind her back just now. As Maggie was about to continue her walk, Gregory quickly interjected. During Ken's burial today, I think I saw your husband Glenn's grave vandalized, probably the work of some mischievous child. Upon hearing this, Maggie hurriedly pushed the baby carriage to check. As Maggie turned the corner of a small building, a figure in black appeared behind her. By the time Maggie noticed, she had already been knocked down, and the baby was crying on the ground. The person in black covered Maggie's mouth to prevent her from screaming. Maggie, not one to back down, engaged in a struggle with the assailant. Though she found herself at a disadvantage in terms of strength, Enid hears the commotion and rushes over to back up Maggie, but she's slapped by the man in black onto a nearby water pipe and passes out. Maggie takes the opportunity to punch the man in black. Alden and Cindy arrive to assist. Maggie rushes up and pulls off the hat of the man in black, who turns out to be Ken's father. In an instant, Marge understood something. Having settled her son, Maggie stormed angrily into Gregory's room, seeing Maggie's bloodied face. Gregory pretended not to know what had happened. Maggie, seething with anger, confronted him, accusing him of trying to kill her, but being too much of a coward to do it himself. You really want to leave here? Maggie asked. But you're too spineless even to take a life. Gregory retorted, claiming that he had built the hilltop, and Maggie was nothing more than Rick's lapdog. After saying that, Gregory directly stabbed Maggie with the knife in his hand. Fortunately, Maggie had anticipated this move and was prepared. This old man is really a wimp who only knows how to play this kind of thing. Maggie grabbed the knife with her fighting skills and pressed it against Gregory's neck. The next day, Rick and Daryl arrived at the hilltop. As soon as they dismounted they stared at Maggie's face, wondering what was going on. In the evening, Rick held Maggie's baby with a pampered look on his face. To honor her father's memory, Maggie had named the baby Herschel. They engaged in casual conversation for a while. Rick told us why he was here today. He wanted Maggie to help him fix the bridge to make it easier for the communities to communicate with each other. Currently, the hilltop was in the best condition, with abundant manpower and an excess of food that couldn't be consumed. So Rick had the cheek to say, you've always been generous, aiding the saviors for over a year, but I still need more. He explained that repairing the bridge required additional resources and manpower. Therefore, he hoped Maggie would be generous once again. After considering for a moment, Maggie responded, I won't stop my people if they want to help repair the bridge, but if there's no return on our resources, I won't continue. The Hilltop already have a lot of people who have a problem with that. So Salvation Hall wants food I can give it to them but they have to provide most of the manpower to build the bridge. Additionally, they should supply fuel made from withered corn to the Hilltop. Rick, however, insisted that helping Salvation Hall was their duty in its current precarious state, and they shouldn't impose conditions. Maggie directly countered, why is it a duty? They surrendered. Not killing them is already a huge favor. She argued that the Hilltop themselves hadn't resolved their own issues. So how could they manage Salvation Hall's problems? Rick found himself momentarily speechless in response. Later that evening, Maggie gathered all the Hilltop. She was going to settle the matter of Gregory once and for all. Gregory was to face execution by hanging. He begged for mercy, desperately seeking another chance. But Maggie's gaze remained cold and unmoved. She nodded to Daryl. Michonne caught sight of two children behind them and tried to signal Maggie to stop. 
not wanting the kids to witness the gruesome scene. However, Rick stopped her, Daryl slaps his horse's arse, Gregory swings like a swing, Maggie couldn't stand it this time, she had forgiven Gregory multiple times before, but his unrepentant behavior and attempt on her life had pushed her to this extreme, the thought of what might have happened to her son if Gregory had succeeded was unbearable, 